Essential Thyroid Gland Basics. Hi, Dr. So Parker again. Welcome to Section 1 of PESA Productions Thyroid Eye Disease 10 Part Series. The material in this series is meant to be easily understood. Parts, however, may be somewhat dense, and you may wish to review particular sections. If you have suggestions on how to improve this series, we welcome your comments. You may find us on the web at www.plasticeyesurgery.com, email us at info at pesahouston.com, write to us at Plastic Eye Surgery Associates, 3730 Kirby Drive, Suite 900, Houston, Texas, 77098, or telephone us at 713-795-0705. Since most people with thyroid eye disease also have a thyroid dysfunction, with thyroid hormone levels too high or too low, it is worth understanding the basics of how the thyroid gland works and is regulated. We also look carefully at why the common thyroid blood tests may not accurately reflect how you feel and how your body is functioning. This section, section one, entitled Essential Thyroid Gland Basics, is divided into four videos. Video 1 covers the basics of thyroid gland and its regulation. Video 2 reviews some of the impacts of the thyroid on the whole body. Video 3 explains why you might still feel terrible even if your blood tests are normal. Video 4 covers what is probably the most complicated material in this entire series, not because any of the individual concepts are difficult to understand, but because the material is stacked layer upon layer upon layer. It is well worth reviewing this video again and again, since the bottom line message holds powerful clues to who gets thyroid eye disease and how the disease might be modified. The thyroid gland lives at the front base of the neck, and in this person it is quite enlarged. You can see the swelling at the base of the neck. An enlarged thyroid gland is often called a goiter. Confusingly enough, a goiter may develop in a gland that is producing too much thyroid hormone or in a gland that is producing too little. Most often, physicians treat people with thyroid disorders based upon the levels of three blood tests, TSH, T3, and T4. So understanding thyroid disorders requires an understanding of what these blood tests mean. What are TSH, T3, and T4? As we've said, the thyroid gland lives at the base of the neck. The pituitary gland lives at the base of the brain. Some like to think of the thyroid gland as the furnace of the body, and the pituitary as the thermostat, regulating the thyroid gland. The pituitary regulates the thyroid gland function by releasing thyroid-stimulating hormone, also known as TSH. TSH turns the thyroid gland on, but instead of heat, the thyroid gland produces two hormones, thyroxin, also known as T4, and triiodothyronine, also known as T3. T4 and T3 are made from the amino acid tyrosine. And you can see the only difference between T4 and T3 is whether there are three or four atoms of iodine attached to the amino acid. Tyrosine is made in the body from another amino acid called phenylalanine which is an essential amino acid. That means that phenylalanine must come from the diet. Without phenylalanine, there can be no tyrosine. The following foods are good sources of phenylalanine and thus are important in the production of tyrosine and the creation of T4 and T3 by the thyroid. Already we begin to see how important diet can be in normal thyroid function and in thyroid disorders. Just as heat produced by the furnace will feed back and turn off the thermostat, the thyroid hormones T4 and T3 shut down the pituitary's release of TSH, thus decreasing the stimulation of the thyroid gland and decreasing further production of T4 and T3. It is essential to understand that just as a key and a lock have a very specific relationship, one specific key fitting one specific lock, these proteins and hormones such as TSH, T4, and T3, act as highly specific keys binding to highly specific locks called receptors in other proteins. Instead of opening a lock, an activated receptor turns on a function within a cell. 
the key lock and hormone receptor analogy is good, but not perfect. For example, if you put a wrong key in a lock, a key that slides into the lock fully but does not really turn and lock, unlock the lock, the presence of the wrong key in the lock can block the right key from performing its function as long as the wrong key is in the lock. Perhaps you've heard of the stories where broken toothpicks are shoved into a lock to prevent someone from getting their key to work. This happens with a similar but wrong hormone as well. It can block a receptor from being activated by the correct hormone. However, hormones are a little different from keys because in biology, two different hormones may both activate the same receptor but with different degrees of effect. For example, one hormone may activate the receptor a little, whereas another may activate the receptor a lot. Understanding the concept of hormone receptor interaction is critical to understanding autoimmune thyroid disorders. So we can now clearly understand how increased T4 and T3 levels lead to diminished TSH levels. And vice versa, with decreased T4 and T3 levels being associated with higher TSH levels. Low thyroid conditions have high TSH and high thyroid conditions have low TSH. There are two main points to take away from this video. First, that there is an awesome feedback loop where the more T4 and T3 you have, the TSH production is turned off and you make less T4 and T3. Second, both T4 and T3 and thus TSH production all depend in part upon diet.